We had a good d d discussion on ensuring global energy security and adequate oil supplies to support global economic growth. We do need to tackle seriously inflation, meaning monetary policy is tightening. We are asking our central banks to keep in mind their primary mandate of price stability. And frankly, I think in 2021, our central bank lost its way. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Stocks climb as central banks take centre stage this week. The ECB battles to restore its credibility with financial markets. A rate hike is expected on Thursday. Coalition collapse, the political alliance propping up Mario Draghi's government in Italy comes crashing down, with snap elections ever more likely. Plus... Scorching heat, thousands flee their homes as wildfires rip through parts of southern Europe. The UK bracing for its highest temperatures on record. Let's check in then on these markets as many people reach for their AC units. You're seeing gains across the European equity space. You're looking ahead, of course, to that rate decision on Thursday from the ECB, the BOJ as well. The markets and the ECB have been very clear about this. 25 basis points is very likely, of course, on Thursday. China, the Asian session being pretty positive. China leaning on the banks to support property developers. There's a mortgage strike going in there. COVID cases picking up as well. But nonetheless, you saw gains across Chinese equities. So upside in terms of the futures, building on the gains and the positivity that you saw on Friday. On the back of easing expectations around inflation from the University of Michigan survey, up eight-tenths of a percent for the S&P futures. The Bloomberg dollar index, this is part of the mix as well. Softer dollar helping that risk on move. Down five-tenths of a percent. Euro benefiting yen sterling as well. The Italian 10-year, we continue to watch this, of course, an eight basis point move on the yields there. The benchmark and the spread, over 200 basis points with the German Bunds on the 10-year level, 335 on the political risk. Wednesday is the day when Mario Draghi will have to finally make that decision as to whether he continues or indeed follows through with that resignation threat. Brent at 104, gaining 2.9% despite Biden coming back from the Middle East saying he thinks maybe the Saudis will increase output. Let's switch it over, see how things then are playing out across the map. So even in Italy, even despite those political concerns, gains of seven tenths of a percent. Most pronounced here in the UK back on the back of basic resources and energy up very strongly. Certainly iron ore, copper and oil, as we mentioned there, gaining and the UK in the FTSE 100, betting, benefiting from that up more than 1.2%. The DAX also up uh, 1% as well. So it's a positive picture across the European space as we look ahead to that decision by the ECB. The dollar, and I mentioned the softness that we're seeing in the session today, but overall, of course, you've seen king dollar at play, and that's causing concern. The world's pain focused on the dollar. Based on its current trajectory, the world may be in for a whole lot more discomfort. Concerns over global growth have recently sent the Bloomberg dollar index to the strongest level on record. Of course, with the caveat that's down five tenths of percent in the session today. The greenback hitting multi-decade highs against currencies like the euro and the yen. Anika Trion from Van Landschot Kempen is with us now for analysis and the market take on this. Anika, what do you make then of the king dollar moves and how you expect to see the FX component play out in the earnings season for Q2? Hi, good morning, Tom. Well, look, we're, we're not here to make very outspoken currency predictions, but I think what, what we must agree, what, what we must sort of put out there is the fact that the dollar is multidimensional. So, of course, the dollar strength has been fueled by a hawkish Fed inflation. But what's also very important, as you say, is it's the flight to safety. And it's not just about flight to safety around recession. It's also about flight to safety around the geopolitical um, problems that we're seeing also, you know, recently resurfaced in Italy. And to your point, you know, the dollar can inflict huge amounts of pain, you know, thinking about emerging market countries, but also looking at the corporate earnings season. You know, it's thought that one percentage move in the dollar could already inflict 0.5 percent on the EPS of, of corporate earnings. So that, that's one to track very closely. Yeah, absolutely. And we will be doing that across uh, Bloomberg TV. Uh, absolutely. And Nick, in terms of what we're seeing across the markets today, how much conviction do you think this, this relief rally that we're seeing has? W would you want to be putting money to play uh, on this bet or is it looking fragile to you? 
Well, it's, it's, it's sort of a bizarre set of circumstances. So short-term inflation is still out of control. But what the Fed has actually done very, very well in terms of trying to restore credibility is anchoring the long end of the curve. And it's quite remarkable that the market is now pricing in 2.8% inflation over the long term. That's not far off at all from the Fed's target of 2%. So the point is, we know inflation will come down. We also know that growth will slow. The point is, um, we don't know what the path will be in terms of getting there. And that's why it's a tricky situation. That's why a lot of people call it the bear market rally. It's tough to navigate over the very short term. And do, do that, does that lower rate uh, projection then take you to, to duration? Is, is duration looking attractive then with rates at these levels? Well, it, it, it certainly is. And, and the point, you know, the first point is how sustainable are these long term rate expectations? How sustainable is it that with a current print of nine, um, people are sort of quite confident about reaching below 3%. And it all hinges on the point that the Fed needs to continue a no-tolerance policy around inflation. And they need to continue that amidst increasing concerns around recession. In fact, if you look at the GDP now forecast, it's already citing the official technical two quarters of recession. So if the Fed can continue to do so, then indeed, that, that definitely holds. OK, and Annika, where does, where does the re-rating take you then? What, what, what is looking uh, attractive? Uh, uh, where is, it, is there value amongst this uh, re-rating that we've seen? Well, the, the tricky thing is you've got the multiples and then you've got the earnings. And thus far, you have seen very sharp multiple de-ratings. And that's why people talk about, you know, the likelihood of a mild recession somewhat being priced in. But what you haven't seen yet is much, much action on the earnings side. And that is worrying. Mm. In fact, it's, it's quite shocking to see how high earnings estimates have been holding up. We know about the dollar hit. That's something incremental. Microsoft alluded to it as well. But what about the underlying economy hits? That's something which this, that's something we believe that this upcoming earnings season will start to reveal. OK, the importance of this upcoming earnings season. We'll get more of your calls after the break. Views, of course, on what's happening across Europe. Annika Trion, Managing Director at Van Lanschot Kempen, stays with us. Coming up later in the show, well, the gloves are off. Are off. Uh, the UK's leadership race turns personal in the second of three debates. Determine who will succeed Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. We have the details later in the programme. This is Bloomberg. Recession, I think, is pretty likely now, certainly in Germany, which is particularly reliant on um, gas supply from Russia. The main factors of uh, creating a recession will not be only monetary policy. I mean, we, we live in a very uncertain environment. I think debt crisis is, is a low probability because we've seen the central bank, you know, continue to be very supportive. They continue to come out with new tools. A lot will depend on the decisions that might be taken on gas on energy. It's difficult to predict, but we do our utmost to avoid, uh, uh, well, the severe impact of our GDP and uh, our employment rates. In the adverse scenario, which has to do with negative surprises on the energy front, we might have recession next year. If you are able to keep your eye on the direction and make the right investment, it will all be about selection. Recovery can only happen by 2024. If the economy is not entering into a deep recession. All right, some uh, key voices there on the outlook for the European economy ahead of this week's key uh, ECB meeting. The central bank will have its work cut out for it amid rising global interest rates, pesky inflation, pesky inflation, all right, uh, and a risk of Russian gas supplies being cut. And now, of course, a political crisis in Italy, still with us, is Annika Trion, Managing Director at Van Lanschot Camp. And Anka, uh, Annika, thank you for staying with us. I'm looking at uh, Italian equities right now, gaining more than 1%, and the bond markets over in Italy don't look overly concerned. The Italian BTP is at 3.34 uh, on the 10-year, just up six basis points on the yield there. It doesn't seem like markets are overly concerned about political risk emanating from Italy. Are they right? Well, I think at the moment, markets are quite pleased about the fact that long-term inflation expectations are starting to abate. 
which mm. gives hope to the fact that while we are getting ourselves out of this inflationary spiral, but if you zoom in into what's happening in Europe, in Italy, you know, the crisis there, but also the energy crisis and what's happening in Germany, it's a very worrying picture. It's sort of a perfect storm that's hitting the European economy at the moment. Yeah, listen, talk to me about the, the German risk then. We were talking about this during the break. I thought it was fascinating. You're saying, OK, Italy is one factor, but Germany is really front and centre in terms of concern as a potential drag on the overall Eurozone economy. Yeah, well, we're really concerned about Germany. So we know Germany is about a third of European GDP. And if you take a step back and consider that an economy with almost $4 trillion of GDP is struggling to provide basic amenities to its population, which is, you know, basic amenities of water, um, heating potentially, landlords, cooperatives, talking about lowering the temperature of buildings at night. It is quite remarkable. And it all boils down to if Germany is not able to get access to the required supply of natural gas, you could see COVID-like lockdowns take place, which is sort of enormous reductions in, in production, um, obviously big, big recessionary risks associated with that. Uh, well, Annika, talking, talking of the gas flows then, more broadly, commodities. What do you do with commodities in this environment? They were crushed across the board last week in particular. There's a bit of a comeback in terms of oil and copper and iron ore in the, in the session today. Do, do you like commodities? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, commo the commodity trade gets quite complicated because there's, there's various drivers and obviously the dollar strength also has its, has its role to play over there. Now, if you think about, well, if you're th thinking about commodities as an asset class, let's first think about the demand drivers. Let's think about what's happening. And, you know, from a European standpoint, you see that the European economic story is very, very much risk at, at a recession. You see that consumer spending is shifting away from the manufacturing sector towards the services, services sector. That's one element. But also, you know, looking at more hawkish central bank policy and, and what that means, um, how consumers are dealing with higher mortgage rates, etc. That, that side of the story still, still plays a very, very important role. Okay, Annika Trion from Van Landschot Kempen on the risks, particularly facing Europe, a potential perfect storm and the need to scrutinise what is happening uh, in Germany, of course, particularly as we await to see whether Russia does indeed fully cut off those gas supplies. Coming up, the Farnborough Air Show starts today, showcasing the best of both commercial and military aviation. We're going to be speaking to Boeing Commercial Airlines CEO Stan Deal. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Now, the Farnborough Air Show starts today, showcasing the best of commercial and military aviation. It is the first time the event has taken place since 2019. And who better to be on the ground there than Guy Johnson, who has a solid guest, another solid guest for us. Guy. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Similar sort of discussion to the one we just had. It's all about what is happening with the supply chain. Um, I'm chuckling because Stan Deal's sitting next to me. He's the CEO of uh, Boeing Commercial Airplanes. We were making sure he was fully hydrated, had the bottle in his hand. He's just lobbed it uh, to the other side of uh, our, our studio here uh, at Farnborough. Stan, great to see you. Thank you, Guy. Nice great to have you. Here. Nice to have you here on the, on the airfield at Farnborough. Last time we were here was 2018. These air shows are normally about big orders. You guys need some momentum right now. You've had issues with the MAX, deliveries of the H7. We'll talk about the X a little bit later on. What kind of momentum are you going to bring to this show? Yeah, Guy, you're right. Four years ago, uh, we were last here, and, uh, and momentum is the name of this show. We're, uh, we're ready to uh, announce some orders. Today will be a big day, and I think you'll see orders uh, consistent through the week. Uh, and, and More than so ever? I'm very excited. Well, we'll have to see the, the tally at the end of the day. That's my job is yep. to try to get more than Airbus. So I'm going to work on that. You confident you can do it? I am. I am. We've got a great product lineup. Yep. Uh, a lot of it is here. We have the brand new Max 10, the, our largest family member. We have the 777-9. Uh, you know, the Max family completes with the 10 and yep. the 7. And we've got the 8, 9, and the 8200 already in the market. 
So five family member family that is uh, competing well against Airbus. And on the wide body side, uh, I think we have the best portfolio to take to market. The, the 10 is here. When are we going to see it certified? When are we going to see that aircraft? Because there, there, was, there was concern that it yeah. might get cancelled if they didn't get the FAA's sign off pretty shortly. Yeah, well, our job is to get it certified, and uh, that's what we're focused on. We're working to get that job done by the end of the year. If it takes a little more time, we'll talk to Congress about an extension. Uh, I'm confident we will certify this airplane, and you'll see it in market quite soon. In terms of the supply chain, let's talk a little bit about that. That's where the crunch crunch lies. I've just been speaking to, to Spirit Aero. I, they're watching yes. their supply chain very, very carefully. They're, they're watching the kind of the, the financials in particular because you, you get paid when you deliver an airplane, That's and right. that money then trickles down through the system, through the supply chain. And there's a lot of stress in the system right now. How stressed is the system? You said yesterday at a briefing that you thought we were halfway through this. What gives you confidence that we are only halfway through this? Well, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing where the weak points are in the supply chain now. Six months ago, it was hard to see some of those weak points. A lot of us made assumptions about bringing back resources based on past practice. Uh, with COVID, every industry has seen resources aren't coming back as fast. So we had to bake that in. Now we see the weak, weak links in the supply chain. Uh, Engines are one. I think you're hearing yep. that uh, from Airbus as well as Boeing. Uh, so we are focused with those partners to try to help them bring resources back in, get learning curves flattened so that the output can increase. That's the name of the game. Uh, it's not a CapEx constraint because our industry capacitized in the past upturn. Yeah. It's really that human capital coming in. That's kind of issue number one. And we do see effects of ship shortages. Uh, so that'll be the other one we watch as we move into our rate growth. What does a recession mean for Boeing? Uh, it's, the, it's the discussion that everybody's having if, right now. If I could predict that, uh, I'd, be, uh, I'd be a great investor. Yeah. It, it's hard to tell yet. Uh, I think uh, we've seen this rapid resurgence of travel when uh, the markets are ready. And when they're ready, it's when yeah. the population's vaccinated. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of still pinned up demand in the market that's going to carry us through some of this recessionary pressure that may occur. Uh, look, we'll watch it. Uh, we're going to adjust rates to meet the market demand. Today, we're supply constrained, so those rates yep. can't quite match demand. Uh, but we'll look, we'll look out there to see if there's any headwinds we have to adjust for. You're, you're hinting there at the possibility that airlines won't take all the aircraft that they've got on the books right now. Well, I'm not hinting at that. I'm just saying if that were to be the case. Uh, today, we see strong demand, uh, for, particularly for the narrow body. And what we're starting to see is many more discussions about yeah. the wide bodies uh, because okay. The U.S. to Europe's connecting strong yep. now into Latin America, the Middle East, India is starting to connect internationally. And so first come back will be orders on 787, and I think you'll see orders in a few years for that 777-9 down the road here. Okay, let's, let's talk about the 87 for a moment. When are regulators going to clear that aircraft for delivery? I think pretty soon. We're not going to put a date out there. Dave, what does what what soon, what before, soon but, mean? But soon is, uh, I characterized it yesterday as we're in the ninth inning of a baseball game, and I don't think there'll be extra innings. So uh, that's the that. best way to con con characterize it. Uh, we want to give our team, the regulator, time to be diligent on this. We don't want to ever look back again. We're looking forward on this airplane. Yeah. Uh, getting that production system tuned right, working through the engineering discrepancies was yep. the name of the game, and we're nearly there. Strong dollar a problem? I, you guys produce in dollars. The it, dollar is it, super strong. It works both ways, right? We, we sell in dollars, and the majority of our supply is in dollars. So uh, once in a while, it's a little headwind. Once in a while, it's a little benefit. Net-net currency typically hasn't swayed our demand uh, supply equation much. OK, great to catch up. Great to see you here in, the, here in the sun of Farnborough. Uh, Stan Deal, the CEO of Boeing Commercial Aeroplanes. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Back to you, Tom. Guy, I'm just so impressed that not only do you have stellar, a stellar line up there, but you're braving the heat for us. We were hoping to see the Panama hat, but you've kept that down.
<laughs> the, the Laura, my producer, is, is not allowing me to wear it. We took our sunglasses off as well. Stan and I were, were, were both sporting very similar, and I have to say, very cool sunglasses just a few minutes ago. Absolutely. Those weren't permitted. OK, let, let, let's, put this, let's, put the sunnies, let's put the sunnies back on. Let's get a snap uh, for, for social media at some point. Guy Johnson, thank you. Uh, fantastic stuff from Farnborough, of course, and braving uh, those record temperatures, or at least near record temperatures, uh, that are hitting the UK. Coming up, the, glo the gloves are off, uh, and the UK's leadership race turns personal in the latest debate to determine who will succeed Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. We're going to get the details next. Your markets are risk on gains of 1.3% across European stocks. US futures, the Nasdaq futures are up pretty strongly, up 1.2%. S&P Emini is gaining close to 1%. The dollar is off by 5 tenths of percent. Euro is bid as is sterling at 119, up 8 tenths of a percent for the pound, and that is a beautiful shot of Parliament on a day where we expect to see record temperatures. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Stocks climb as central banks take centre stage this week. The ECB battles to restore its credibility with financial markets. A rate hike is expected on Thursday. Coalition collapse, the political alliance propping up Mario Draghi's government in Italy comes crashing down, with snap elections ever more likely. Plus, scorching heat, thousands flee their homes as wildfires rip through parts of southern Europe. The UK bracing for its highest temperatures on record. Good Monday morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Risk on across European markets after a solid day on Friday for Wall Street. You're seeing gains of 1.4% across European stocks. The futures in the US, S&P E-mini is up by 1.1%. NASDAQ futures up by 1.4%. You're even seeing Italian equities performing well. The FTSE MIB up 259 points as things stand at 21,195. That's upside of 1.2% uh, for Italian stocks. Here in the UK, the FTSE 100 up 108 points at 7,267. That's a gain of 1.5%. Euro is stronger, pound is stronger, and Bitcoin is also on a tear. Now, the economy took centre stage at yesterday's second UK Conservative Party leadership debate with candidates clashing over tax, inflation, and even the role of the Bank of England. You know what? This something-for-nothing economics isn't conservative. Uh, it's uh, socialism. Under your plans we are predicted to have a recession because you have raised tax, it is cutting back on growth, it is preventing companies from investing, and it's taking money out of people's pockets. That is no way to get the economy going during a recession. OK, for more, we are joined by Bloomberg's uh, Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, was it primetime viewing? Who came out on top? I stayed up and I'm somewhat regretting it now because it got ugly uh, last night. And uh, so you had, as you saw in that clip, Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor, attacking his rivals, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, the former Defence Secretary Penny Mordaunt, accusing them of socialism because of the tax cuts that they're offering. He says that they're offering something for nothing. Meanwhile, presenting himself as the fiscally responsible candidate because he says he's not going to cut taxes until inflation's under control. But even the Bank of England did didn't escape yeah. the mud slinging. Liz Truss says that she won't remove independence, but she might change the mandate. And one macro strategist I spoke to this morning said that that was bonkers, that it could repel foreign investors from guilt. But it's not macro strategists who are voting in this contest. We've got another round of voting today, so we'll see who emerged the front runner in the votes today. That's among MPs. We've got another TV debate tomorrow, a final round of voting among MPs on Thursday, which will knock it down to two names, and they'll be put to the party membership but really the question is whether the party <laughs> membership will be uh, convinced by Sunak's moderate mm. message or seduced by the tax cuts that every other candidate's offering. Yeah, polling suggests that Sunak faces a challenge, doesn't he, uh, when, it, when it comes down to it. He may well get to that final two. So by Thursday, that's what we're looking at in terms of getting to Lizzie Burden taking the hit for us, watching that TV debate so we didn't have to, and breaking down where things stand in terms of the leadership contest then uh, for, of course, the head of uh, the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister of the UK. Let's get to what's happening then in Italy. So from the politics of the UK to the political risk and the travails of Mario Draghi, Italy 
could be heading for a snap election or snap elections as Prime Minister Mario Draghi's coalition breaks down. Draghi insists on quitting, saying he will not lead a new government that does not include the Five Star Movement. The former ECB president is set to address Parliament on Wednesday. For more, we are joined by Bloomberg's Rome bureau chief, Alessandro Speciale. Alessandro, then a crucial week for Italy. What are we expecting from Draghi, the Prime Minister? Well, for now, the signals are still that he is determined to resign. But if you read between the lines here in Rome, in the Roman chapter, there are signs <coughs> that some things may be moving. I mean, the Conte, the five-star leader, the one who started all this crisis, is apparently, according to the papers, losing some control of his lawmakers. So some do not agree with the idea to go all the way and quit Draghi's government. Some lawmakers want to stay, and this might give Draghi a good reason to stay on as well. OK, so watching those divisions within the Five Star movement for a gauge on how this plays out, how much pressure is Draghi under then to change his mind and stay? That's the other factor. More than 1,000 mayors in Italy have written, have uh, subscribed to a letter asking Draghi to stay. The heads of the business organizations, trade unions, all, all parts of Italian society are asking Draghi to stay, and this pressure is mounting. And then, of course, there is President Sergio Mattarella, who uh, rejected Draghi's resignation and told him to go to Parliament to confirm his decision before letting him resign. We'll see if this pressure will be enough to make Draghi change his mind. Yeah, indeed. And if it's not enough, Alessandro, what, what happens? What happens if Draghi resigns? How, what is the playbook? Well, then we go, as we say in these occasions, into completely uncharted territory. The most likely mm. date right now for elections will be September 25, but that's right in the middle of the budget session. So the budget would come either really very late or we, it would be just a very technical budget with no political decisions behind it. And of course, in this moment, with the energy crisis, with inflation, with the war in Ukraine, this would be very risky for Italy. Or we could uh, push this a bit later and have voting early next year. But of course, this would mean that Draghi agrees to stay on a little more. If the resignation is confirmed on Wednesday, we really don't know what is going to happen for now. OK. OK, still a lot of uncertainty in terms of the fate of Mario Draghi, indeed his coalition, and whether indeed you do get to elections. So far, not a lot of ex extreme angst across these markets. Italian BTP is at 332, just a move of four basis points then higher in yield. Equities in, you, in Italy are, are gaining in the session. Alessandro Speciale, our Rome bureau chief, thank you uh, for the latest on that. Coming up, US President Joe Biden says he expects more oil from Saudi Arabia after a landmark meeting with the kingdom's rulers. We are live in Riyadh to assess the reality of that. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Now, governments need to focus their support to avoid undoing the work of central bankers and stoking even more inflation. That is according to the IMS Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva. She sat down with Bloomberg's Haslinda Armin at the G20 Finance Ministers and Central Bank Governors meeting in Bali. We have had a very good technical engagement with uh, the counterparts to our team in Sri Lanka. We hope that there would be the wisdom to come up with the government with authority to move the country out of this uh, terrible crisis. The moment there is a government, there is a minister of finance, and uh, I am confident that we will move our program discussions quite quickly because a lot of the technical work has already been done. But what amount of debt restructuring is needed for the IMF to see that Sri Lanka is on a sustainable path? Uh, we have already uh, seen uh, the um, uh, seriousness with which the debt advisor to Sri Lanka is looking into what would it take to have that resolution. Uh, we have been reaching out to the biggest creditors of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, my sense is that 
there is a, an understanding it would be better for the creditors to step forward because then they have a better chance for the country to recover and for them to recoup more of their money. As it stands now, how much is Pakistan at risk? And how are you assessing the possibilities of the likes of Egypt, Tunisia, heading that way? Uh, we just completed staff level agreement with Pakistan, which allows us to reinforce uh, their reserves and uh, on that basis, we expect some of the bilateral donors, for example, Saudi Arabia, to also extend additional support to Pakistan. Uh, this is not to say that the country is out of danger. Our work uh, has to continue to make sure that there is stabilization uh, that allows fa Pakistan to return to where they were just a year ago on a good track in the reform process. We have a similarly serious and advanced engagement with Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, the countries have different problems, but one thing is common that they need fairly quickly to stabilize their economies uh, that have been hit by exogenous shocks. Now, uh, I am very keen to get our membership to recognize that ultimately structural reforms, strong uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, this is what they need for uh, a world of more, of more frequent exogenous shocks. Zambia, also in focus, the first uh, African nation uh, to default to go bankrupt during the pandemic. It's been waiting for its debt restructuring. Uh, until now, China has not been on board with uh, the creditors committee. What's the status of that? How soon can that happen? Uh, I was very pleased to see that uh, China stepped uh, forward. They are co-chairing the creditors committee for Zambia. And I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, for Zambia, for Chad, progress is being made. Even uh, the uh, Creator Committee for Ethiopia is meeting this uh, month. And that, that has been my message to the G20. It is paramount for the common framework to finally deliver on its promise. Before we let you go, just a final question on dollar strength. No signs of dollar strength abating. I mean, how concerned are you? Are we underestimating that perhaps we could see, uh, I guess, un an unraveling of emerging market currencies? For now, what we see is indeed depreciation of many uh, currencies. But let's remember that majority of uh, emerging markets have learned a lesson from prior crises. They are in a better position overall. This being said, we have to be uh, very seriously focused on how we can get from the situation we are now. Number one priority, fight inflation. We have to get to price stability again, because if we don't, then investment and consumer sentiment suffers, people's incomes are eroded, and uh, the foundation for growth is not as sound as it has to be. But the thing is, it is a higher rate environment. The US may raise rates by 100 basis points. Surely that poses a risk of capital flight from emerging markets. This is correct. We have seen this year, since the beginning of this year, over 50 billion outflows from emerging markets. This is about as much as the inflows were for the whole of last year. And as, as you know, last year was a fairly good year for growth. So it is correct to be concerned. And uh, for this reason, what we are hoping to see is the US continuing to carefully communicate what their intentions are, uh, but also to get on top of the inflation problem as quickly as possible. Okay, an exclusive interview there with IMF Chief Kristalina Georgieva speaking to Haslinda Armin. Okay, let's get your Bloomberg Business Flash now with Leanne Gerens. Leanne. Tom, good morning. The world's two top plane makers, Boeing and Airbus, are expected to wrap up deals worth at least $21 billion ahead of the Farnborough Air Show here in the UK. Delta Airlines is seen as one of the big buyers. The industry's largest trade expo will provide a measure of the strength of the global aviation market. Delta is expected to order up to 130 Boeing 737 MAX 10 jets and a dozen of Airbus's A. 
to 20 planes. Now, Brazilian plane maker Embraer says supply chain disruptions will make it hard for it to meet year-end commercial delivery targets. The CEO has told Bloomberg the company is doing everything it can to mitigate the problems. The maker of small regional jets is maintaining its guidance to deliver between 60 and 70 planes in its e-jet family this year. And ANZ is buying Suncorp Group's banking operations for 3.3 billion US dollars. The lender will seek to raise about 2.4 billion of equity to help fund the takeover. The deal adds a profitable retail and lending network in one of the country's highest growth regions. Bloomberg Intelligence says Suncorp's profitability should get a boost as a pure play insurer. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom. Leanne Gerens, thank you very much indeed. OK, uh, US President Joe Biden says he expects more oil from Saudi Arabia after a landmark meeting with the kingdom's rulers. However, Riyadh is insisting that any decision to pump more oil must be made by OPEC and its partners and not unilaterally. It's not about an agreement. It's about the kingdom's po long-standing policy of uh, working to ensure that there is adequate supply of crude oil on the markets. Um, and, uh, and we follow the supply demand situation very carefully and we determine that if there is a, a potential shortage that uh, we work on increasing crude oil production um, by side through with our OPEC partners and OPEC plus partners. OK, let's get more then with Bloomberg anchor Yusuf Gamal Adin, who's been on the ground, of course, in Saudi Arabia throughout this presidential visit. Yusuf, will the U.S. ultimately be pleased with the outcome of this meeting? So much focus on their symbolism as well. Yeah, remarkable scenes that came out of this magnificent palace in Jeddah where the U.S. president sat down, not just with the Saudi crown prince, but with other Gulf leaders as well. The Saudi version of the story, and I, as you heard from the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, is that the Saudis have a deal with OPEC+. Plus. They want to stick with that deal. They want to go with the process and go with the quota. So that's 11 million barrels per day for the month of August. For the U.S., it is a claim that the Saudis and OPEC can and will do more in the next few weeks. And you kind of pull that together, and initially they might seem contradictory, but they actually have an overlap in the September time window. Because that is when OPEC Plus is going to sit down again and they're going to look at whether or not they're going to create a new pact or new quotas or a new system to start all this over with. So that is going to be something the energy market is going to keep a very, very close eye on. But at the moment, no big wins in terms of barrels today for the United mm. States. OK, so we look ahead to September for a potential reworking of that OPEC Plus pact. What else, Yusuf, stood out? for you from the talks that emanated over the weekend? Well, the first big thing to note is that uh, the U.S. was able to push Saudi Arabia and Israel towards the initial steps towards normalization. They're tiny, but they're still notable. We saw, of course, Saudi Arabia open its skies for uh, commercial traffic stemming from Israel and going to Israel. So that may be just a, a little bit of a move in that direction. Also, the U.S. reasserting its influence in the Gulf. You know, there was a sense that the U.S. has lost its way in this part of the world. Uh, but where they didn't score a big win was on the issue of the murdered journalist and columnist Jamal Khashoggi. At best, a question mark. The Saudis said they exchanged views with the U.S. The president says he made his views clear. But that's all we got on that front. They are now on a much closer page than they were going into the meeting. And the hope from the U.S. side, at least, and also from the Saudi side, is that they can build on these initial steps a meaningful level of trust and credibility that's just been mm. missing in this relationship, Tom. Yeah, very interesting indeed how you navigate the questions of human rights with the need, of course, for oil and, of course, the geopolitics of Israel and Saudi Arabia. Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamela Din, thank you for that analysis and the latest, of course, on what happened through those talks. Let's check in then on oil because, in fact, prices have picked up quite a bit in the session today. Brent is currently trading at 103, as you can see a gain of 2.7%. WTI closing in on $100 a barrel, up 2.4%. The rest of the commodities space as well is higher today on the back of some optimism, softer dollar. But currently, this is the picture across oil. Decent gains there after, of course, oil has come under pressure uh, in the last few weeks. WTI looks like it's going to be closing in on $100 a barrel. Right, coming up, scorching heat. Thousands flee their homes as wildfires rip through parts of southern Europe. 
here in the UK with bracing for the highest temperatures on record. We will get more next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Now to the UK and the rest of Europe as well. The UK bracing for record high temperatures today. That's as heat waves and wildfires rage in parts of Europe. The heat is set to put added strain on Britain's energy system, something that's already under pressure, of course, due to soaring natural gas prices. Joining us in the studio is Bloomberg's Leanne Gares. Leanne, what is this, what does it mean for, for energy bills? What does it mean for households? What does it mean for the kind of discontent that's already building here in the UK? So London is set to be one of the hottest places in the world today, if you can believe it or not, Tom. Hotter than Western Sahara and California. Wow. And doctors, so if we just concentrate on that side before we go to the bill yeah. side, doctors are saying there's a real risk to life as temperatures are set to soar today. So we could see over 40 degrees for the very first time here in the mm. UK. And as you know, our infrastructure is just not built for that, is it? So they're saying that if you're going to get the train home later today, they're going to be going much slower because train infrastructure is going to be battling under all the heat. And also, we're going to be using fans, aren't we? We're going to be possibly buying portable air conditioners, which are really going to be pulling on the electricity grid. And as we know, our bills are going up substantially anyway. So this adds to that pressure that's coming to families. Yeah, bad timing for this uh, for the record high temperatures that we're starting to see what about the rest of the rest of you at the front pages over the weekend dominated by by pictures of, of Spain Croatia Greece what is happening there? yeah so let's put this into context right now we're suffering this heat wave because it's coming in from Europe so Europe have seen unprecedented temperatures even before us and as he just mentioned there France they are battling ferocious wildfires their woodland is really burning in places like Givenge a regional place very popular with tourists 40,000 people have had to be evacuated and also in the Bordeaux region, which is, of course, the winemaking region. So we're seeing big problems over there, too. And also, as you mentioned, in southern Spain, there's also wildfires raging and in Portugal. So this just seems to be engulfing the whole of Europe. And also farmland has been heavily disrupted, especially in France. And some water supplies in Spain have been cut off. So then it starts questions as what's to come in the future once we've cleared all of these, because we know how natural disasters can wreak havoc but the heat wave seems to grind on and the information yep. from the government here is drink plenty of water stay cool and keep out of the midday S stay, sun. Hi stay hydrated Leanne Gerrans always staying cool thank you very much indeed for walking through the latest when it comes to this uh, these record temperatures a redhead crossing uh, the terminal right now China weighing a mortgage grace period for stalled home projects this is after this remarkable story and the fact that in a hundred projects across 50 cities there's a mortgage at, at basically strike uh, across uh, China. Stay with us. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Wall Street's on its keister. Main Street seems to be doing a little bit better, although obviously some signs of stress. We feel like the consumer is very, very stressed right now, and the U.S. economy lives and dies on its consumer. The big money center banks, essentially parts of their business, are already in recession. Big banks are much better capitalized. The banks are solid gold from a credit quality standpoint. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller here in Midtown Manhattan with Kaylee Lines, Anna Edwards with us at a London. Our top stories today, Wall Street report card. Goldman Sachs and Bank America report second quarter earnings. We'll see how much this market turmoil has hit the bottom line. And optimistic about oil, a U.S. Energy Envoy is confident that Gulf producers will increase output after President Biden's trip to the region. Plus, the dollar dips. It extends its retreat from a record high 
Could the dollar doom loop narrative be a little bit late and possibly overdone? Kaylee, we're hearing a lot about the effects of the dollar exporting inflation, hurting EM, but we've seen it come back down a couple of days in, uh, in a row. And Mark Cudmore says we may be time for a pause. Yeah, that's something we'll continue to stay on top of throughout the hour. We also are taking uh, stock of some breaking news out of China. Apparently, regulators weighing a grace period for stom stalled home project mortgages. Remember, we have seen a kind of de facto strike on mortgage payments. Buyers not wanting to make those payments for projects that haven't been done yet. So regulators considering this a step potentially to support China's housing sector. Of course, this news crossing a little bit too late for Asia, considering equities trading is already closed. But the idea that China may be more supportive as the PBOC talks about prudent monetary policy and regulators ask banks to lend more to developers to help them finish those stalled projects did lend support to sentiment overnight. The MSCI Asia Pacific index as a whole up about 1.4 percent and an index of property developers in China specifically was higher by about 3 percent. In other asset classes, really interesting action at the short end of the curve in New Zealand. That two-year yield up 10 basis points to right around 3.63 percent after inflation hit a fresh 32-year high that is leading to bets that the RBNZ will be even more aggressive. And finally, in foreign exchange, as Matt alluded to, it is a weaker dollar story against basically everything. Your strongest currency in Asia, the South Korean won, up about seven-tenths of a percent against that U.S. dollar, Anna. Yeah, and interesting to see how weakness in the dollar plays out and plays up against other assets. Of course, we're risk on here for European equity markets then, Kaylee. Uh, European stocks, almost a sea of green, as you can see in the map behind me. All sectors in the first hour of trade, at least in positive territory. Continuing from Friday's positivity, if at the margin we're deciding that maybe the Fed uh, is not going to get any more hawkish, even if it continues with this current hawkish path, then that is giving some room to risk assets to run. Uh, the same could be said for oil prices. Oil up by just over 2% today. Day, the Brent price with a 103 handle as we see Brent rallying again in keeping with other risk assets. And despite the fact that President Biden and his team seem confident we'll get more supply coming out of the Middle East, we'll wait to see what OPEC Plus decides on that front. The FTSE MIB once again in focus. We have seen this market underperforming because of tensions in, in the Ital Italian political space. And that continued to be the case in the first hour of trading here in Europe. But since then, uh, we've seen spreads uh, narrow a little bit and the tension perhaps ebbed away from the story. We'll focus back on it for sure on Wednesday when we will hear from Prime Minister Mario Draghi as he addresses Parliament over in Italy. And Euro dollar in focus because it's a big week for the ECB. We'll have, uh, we'll have to come to terms with what the reality is for Russian gas flowing into Europe this week uh, post that shutdown for maintenance. We'll also get the latest decision from the ECB. We are expecting, of course, to get a rate hike, but all of that hike talk and narrative uh, coming as the European economy slows down. And a lot of, a lot of people talk about uh, the recession to come here in Europe. And we see tensions at the periphery then, Matt. All right. Well, we're seeing some strong S&P futures action today, up more than 1%. Um, of course, we are still a solid four hours and change away from the open. Um, so that could change. But uh, it looks like everything is aligned here, right? Because we have the 10-year yield coming up as investors let go of that debt. Maybe they no longer feel they need the perceived safety of government debt at 29485. And we have Bitcoin, a very correlated asset, uh, really taking off right now, up 6.5% from midnight, 22,294, 22,300, the level there. I do want to point out that crude's a little bit higher at 9934. So that kind of goes against the narrative that we're getting out of this U.S energy envoy that um, the Saudis and OPEC could play along after Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia. Uh, nonetheless, it's still holding under $100 a barrel, and we have seen energy prices come down. Kaylee? All right, Matt. Well, in addition to watching energy prices, here's a look at what else we will be watching today and the week ahead. Of course, bank earnings will be continuing this morning. Goldman Sachs and Bank of America both reporting before the bell. Then tech earnings will kick off on Tuesday with Netflix. On Wednesday, the EU will unveil its contingency plan in case Russia doesn't resume gas flows through Nord Stream 1, which is scheduled to come back online Thursday after annual maintenance. Plus, we'll get some central bank action, rate decisions from both the BOJ and ECB, are coming on Thursday and also on Thursday we're likely to have the final two candidates in the Tory leadership contest Matt. All right we'll be watching that.
UK leadership contest very closely. Let's get the latest right now on U.S. banks. As more earnings roll out before the bell today, Bank America is set to tell a story about the U.S. consumer, while Goldman will tell us whether it dominated in trading. Shanali Bassett, our global finance correspondent, joins us now for what to expect. Shanali? Yeah, remember that J.P. Morgan and Citigroup both pause share buybacks, and there's a question of whether Bank of America will do the same today. The question is also around not the current state of the consumer, but the provision for credit losses and the expectation for charge-offs. Will the consumer deteriorate depending on that recession that Bank of America's own economists see coming? Moving over to Goldman Sachs, there is an expectation here that fixed income trading, where they tend to really shine, especially in a volatile quarter, there's an expectation that they have a bigger percentage jump than at Citigroup and at J.P. Morgan. So the question for Goldman Sachs is, can they deliver? We also saw J.P. Morgan beat Morgan Stanley in equities trading. Mm -hmm. It was a tough quarter for equities trading, but right now we're talking about market share gains in a tough environment, guys. Okay, well, everyone should definitely watch your coverage of these big bank results throughout the day today. Everyone also should log on to their Bloomberg terminal or online and read today's big take which you wrote it's looking at the next big risk you talk to three big market visionaries I believe Abby Joseph Cohn Sam Bingman Fried and Ken Mollis and they tell you what the big issue may be ahead at times, in the next decade or so yeah what they tell at you. times like these you have to worry uh, what's on the horizon not just what's right in front of us right so Abby Joseph Cohen what she's worried about is a fading American dream is the next generation doing better than the previous generation she's really worried about the labor force the worry uh, the way that the US is investing in its labor force and immigration policy. And to that end, what Ken Mullis is worried about is not just the people who are coming into the United States, but the United States relative to the rest of the world as deglobalization tends to quicken in the wake of this war started in Ukraine. Uh, Sam Bankman frieds worry is a lot more simple. He's worried about the next pandemic. And what he says is we are not uh, learning anything from the way that we have handled the previous one. So the reason it matters for him is he's spending a lot of his personal time and money, charitable uh, and the charitable and political donations, in order to address that problem itself. Janali, thanks very much. Bloomberg Janali Basak there, and uh, the next big risk is available now on the Bloomberg terminal and at uh, Bloomberg.com, of course. And tune in on Wednesday for a full airing at 9:30 p.m in New York. Thanks to Shanali for bringing us that story. Now, a U.S. energy envoy is optimistic Gulf producers will increase oil output after President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, the Saudi State Minister of Foreign Affairs played down the idea of any agreement. The two leaders spoke after Biden's meeting with the kingdom's rulers. Well, just before the president announced his trip, just a few days before that, mm -hmm. OPEC Plus made a uh, a major shift in its policies, uh, recognizing that since Putin started amassing forces, uh, the markets have been affected and that there was a supply demand issue and announced increases in supply of 50 percent for july and august right. uh, and i'm based on what we heard on the trip i'm i'm pretty confident that we'll see a few more steps uh in the coming weeks it's not about an agreement it's about the kingdom's po long-standing policy of uh, working to ensure that there is adequate supply of crude oil on the markets um, and uh, and we follow the supply demand situation very carefully and we determine that if there is a, a potential shortage, that uh, we work on increasing crude oil production um, by side through with our OPEC partners and OPEC plus partners. That was the Saudi State Minister of Foreign Affairs speaking with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Jeddah. Anne-Marie is back in Washington after her trip following the president to the United States. I mean, the administration talking positively about what they think they have achieved, but expectations always had to be moderated, I suppose. Yeah, coming out of this meeting, you have both sides, Ria and Washington, really spinning what was potentially agreed upon. At the moment, nothing was agreed upon. There's no firm announcement on more oil coming from the Kingdom or other OPEC Plus suppliers. But what the White House says is that in the coming weeks, we could see that. So that points to the next OPEC meeting in August. And you still have the likes of Adel al Jaber, who's a top Saudi diplomat, saying we need to look at the supply dynamics. But we should note that even if oil was to come online in August in an agreement, it wouldn't be calibrated to the fall. It would still come very close to helping the president in those midterm elections, potentially with gasoline feeling the um, repercussions of the more oil price very close to November midterm elections. Well, and that brings us to domestic policy, Anne-Marie, because while the president was abroad focused on foreign policy, his domestic agenda took a hit again when Senator Joe Manchin said he would not support any measures on climate spending or tax increases. Where does that package stand now then? 
Yeah, not exactly a warm welcome home for the president. He has more infighting within his Democratic Party. Senator Manchin said he saw that 9.1 percent inflation read on Wednesday, and that gave him the reservations to go ahead with this deadline set for this specific package, which would be tax hikes as well as provisions to fight climate change. So potentially he's willing to get on board with that, but he wants to see another inflation print read. This tracks with what we've heard from Senator Manchin for months. His concerns about inflation started last, sep last summer when he wrote that letter to Fed uh, Chair Jay Powell. Right now, Kaylee, the one thing that potentially Senator Manchin could get on board with was is prescription drugs and some enhancements of Obamacare, um, some medical issues. But right now, those tax hikes and climate change provisions would have to wait till after August. But that goes against the deadline that uh, Senator mm. Chuck Schumer has set for the Senate. Manchin back in the headlines. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington. Thank you very much for the analysis. Now, clear dividing lines over the economy emerged as the UK's leadership race turned personal in the second of three debates. The five remaining candidates repeatedly clashed over policy. You know what? This something-for-nothing economics isn't conservative. Uh, it's uh, socialism. Under your plans, we are predicted to have a recession because you have raised tax. It is cutting back on growth. It is preventing companies from investing and it's taking money out of people's pockets. That is no way to get the economy going during a recession. Meanwhile, in Italy, Prime Minister Mario Draghi is under pressure to reverse his pledge to resign and avoid throwing Italy into further chaos. He's due to tell lawmakers his decision on Wednesday. Let's get more now with our Milan Bureau Chief, Tommaso Ebhardt, who joins us. Uh, Tommaso, so a lot of focus then midweek on what Mario Draghi has decided to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we are almost three days from the risk of Italy getting into political chaos. Mario Draghi will speak Wednesday to Lumaker. As far as we know, at the moment, he's determined to say that he will uh, resign because uh, the uh, coalition that used to back him doesn't exist anymore after the Five Star decided not to vote uh, confidence to the government last week. But, but there is a lot of pressure on Mario Draghi to uh, reverse his decision and to stay. Pressure is coming uh, from uh, a business lobby, from uh, hundreds of mayors in Italy, from a petition which uh, was launched by former Prime Minister uh, Matteo Renzi, which was signed by over 80,000 uh, people. Today, there are going to be also some rally in um, Rome and Milan to ask uh, Draghi to stay. And this morning, there was a column on Italy's biggest newspaper, Il Corriere della Sera, by Professor Mario Monti, a former premier, say Mario shouldn't resign because his legacy could be at risk. So uh, there is a small path that may lead uh, for, Mario, for Mario Draghi to stay and to calm the situation. But at the moment, the most likely scenario for us is still him to resign. Tommy, thanks so much for joining us. Tommaso Eberhardt there, uh, Bloomberg's bureau chief out of Milan. Now, the Farnborough Air Show is back for the first time since 2019 with a convention showcasing the best of commercial and military aviation. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Guy Johnson at the event. Guy, what's going on? Matt, if you want a more visible example of supply chain crunches, issues with labor shortages, uh, then there probably isn't one more than the aviation industry. The aviation industry is suffering across the board. Uh, we're seeing it uh, with air traffic control, labor shortages uh, at airports, Heathrow Airport, a classic example. Uh, and then you get into the manufacturers uh, that are going to be represented here at the air show. They're having huge supply chain problems at the moment. Demand is ramping up very quickly for aircraft. Uh, Making sure that those orders get fulfilled is a huge problem. I've just been speaking to Stan Deal. He is the, uh, the CEO of Boeing Commercial Aeroplanes. He reckons we're only halfway through this process uh, of getting the supply chains sorted. We've got big problems, particularly with the engine manufacturers. That needs to be resolved and resolved very quickly. So this is a very visible example uh, of what is happening more broadly in the global economy with global industry. Uh, mm -hmm. There are labor shortages, there are material shortages, uh, and there are huge supply chain bottlenecks that still have yet to be worked out. Well, guys, speaking of visible examples, we're also seeing a visible example of the heat in the UK as you brave those temperatures out at Farnborough. How hot is it right now? 
Uh, it's warming up quite nicely, Kaylee. I have my sunglasses and my hat. Uh, there is a very kind member of the crew standing behind me with an umbrella. Uh, it is going to warm up. Uh, it's going to warm up a lot later on. At the moment, we're on grass, which is great. But over on the tarmac, I think it's going to be well north of 40 a little bit later on, well into the hundreds, I think, uh, at around 4 or 5 o'clock, just when we're talking to Airbus this afternoon. All right, well, stay hydrated, Guy. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson at the Farnborough Air Show. Thank you so much. And Guy will be back shortly for an interview with United Airlines Chief Sustainability Officer Lauren Riley. Now let's get to the U.S. markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. And speaking of that air show, investors seem to like what they're hearing out of Boeing because those shares are outperforming in early hours, up about 2.3% before the bell. And we were talking earlier, Matt was talking about the rally we are seeing uh, in some... Uh, riskier assets, Bitcoin among them. I believe Bitcoin is up about 6% at the moment, and that is feeding right through to crypto-related equities in pre-market trading. The likes of Coinbase, the big crypto exchange, is higher by about 6.5%. And it's not just limited to crypto and Bitcoin. You're really seeing a rally in some riskier, higher-growth assets more broadly. And a real poster child of that is the ARK Innovation ETF, Kathy Wood's flagship fund. We know it hasn't fared very well as of late, but it is enjoying that rally in early hours this morning, up about 3% before the bell, Anna. Coming up on this program, how likely is a European recession in the next six months? We will speak with Josie Dent from the Centre for Economics and Business Research. The ECB meets this week. We will ask what she expects. Plus, get used to the heat, how record temperatures from the UK to Texas are challenging the global energy system. More ahead. This is Bloomberg. I think uh, we've seen this rapid resurgence of travel when uh, the markets are ready and when they're ready, it's when yeah. the population's vaccinated. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of still pinned up demand in the market that's going to carry us through some of this recessionary pressure that may occur. Uh, look, we'll watch it. Uh, we're going to adjust rates to meet the market demand. That was Stan Deal, Boeing CEO of Commercial Airplanes, speaking to Bloomberg's Guy Johnson at the Farnborough Air Show a little bit earlier today when temperatures were not quite as hot as they are now. Guy is still at the air show and joins us with another top airline executive. Guy. Yep, we're warming up nicely here at the Farnborough Air Show. Um, I'm joined now by Lauren Riley. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer uh, for United Airlines. Uh, in some ways, what we're seeing here today may be sort of emblematic of actually the challenge that you face, higher and higher temperatures. Let's talk a little bit about this industry and what it's got to go through over the next few years in order to meet the requirements that are being set by government. It is an industry that is facing huge challenges. Um, we've got supply chain crunches. We're trying to figure out how ATC is going to work, all of those sort of things. Is there a danger that the environmental, the sustainability side gets drowned out? Well, I've got to tell you, Guy, how exciting is it that we're here at the world's largest air show and central to the conversation is sustainability. Yep. I think that demonstrates right there just how important it is and how critical it is that we work together to solve the crisis of decarbonizing aviation together. How... How possible is it going to be? I look at the technology around me here and incrementally we're moving in the right direction. But it feels like this is an industry that needs to go through some really big step changes using technology that in some ways doesn't even exist yet. How much are we putting on that technology? How much faith do we have to have that it's going to be ready? Well, we just rebounded from the biggest disruption in the aviation history, frankly, with the pandemic. And I think we're proving that we're coming out more nimble, more focused, more disciplined on those areas that make sense and are really critical for our success moving forward. And environmental impact is part of that. Yes, a lot of the solutions we're looking at need to scale, but we know what the solutions are. So I look at it as a story of optimism. We have the solution. We need to create a market so that it yep. scales and we can transition over to lower carbon solutions. We all at Bloomberg spend a lot of time at the moment talking about fuel prices, yeah. oil prices, jet fuel prices have absolutely skyrocketed. But that is not the long term fuel that this industry is going to be using. Sustainable aviation fuel is ultimately the target. Maybe it's just a midterm target, but it's a target that we need to get to to be able to scale the amount of sustainable av aviation fuel there is available for the industry. Does higher jet fuel make that easier? Does the cost squeeze make it actually an easier transition to go from one to the other? 
Well, it certainly helps. So sustainable aviation fuel, which is derived from waste and renewable materials, is sometimes twice to four times the cost of conventional jet fuel. So as conventional jet fuel prices increase, the, the difference, the premium to uh, sustainable aviation fuel diminishes. And that's helpful. But ultimately, we don't want to be benchmarking against uh, jet A markets. We actually want to create a product that has security in the supply chain so that we can build a future that, that burns fuel that's derived from lower carbon emitting solutions. President Biden's just been to the Gulf. He's looking for more oil supplies. From, from a number of different sources. He's desperate to get gasoline prices lower. Could he do more, though, when it comes to alternatives? I, at the moment, it feels like it's a policy decision by the administration not to allow more feedstock, et cetera, and more tax credits, et cetera, to help this industry make this transition. You're absolutely correct that this is a policy issue today. So as I mentioned, we are in the, the early stages of creating a market that doesn't exist. And if we're going to tip the scale so that we can accelerate the progress to move to these lower carbon solutions like sustainable aviation fuel, we need supportive policies. I will caution, though, we want to make sure that those policies are not patchwork. We need a uniform approach so that we can actually implement those policies across the industry because we are global. And why, but why is, is the U.S. government, why are other governments not making this move faster? Well, I wish I had the answer to that, yeah. but I don't. Um, I do know that there's a commitment by this administration, and they've been great partners in helping understand the core issues related to scaling sustainable aviation fuel in particular, as well as other emerging technologies. I think time will tell what policies come out in the United States. Okay, let's talk finally about regulation. Um, we have scope one, we have scope two, we have scope three. These are basically disclosures that companies make about their, their environmental impact, um, their supply chain uh, environmental impact, that's scope three. That is what you deliver. You deliver to uh, the industry via, via the SEC filings your scope three, your, your entire supply chain and the impact that it has. Why have you made the decision to do that now? Why are, more other, why are other companies doing it? And do you think it should be mandatory that actually the entire supply chain should actually be documented when companies release their earnings? United has been disclosing its scope one, two, and three for more than 10 years on a voluntary basis. I think what's different this year is that we actually disclosed it in our SEC filings in our 10K. So we disclosed scope one, two, and three in that filing. And for us, it was really a, a conversation around integrity. We don't have anything to hide. We want to be transparent. There's a lot of scrutiny right now around progress in the industry. And we welcome that because it facilitates a constructive discussion. And if we have to show our metrics, we are more than happy to do that. And I encourage every other industry every other corporation that has the ability to move in that direction. As far as scope three, yes, we need to disclose those and focus on those material activities that drive scope three. And for us, that's jet fuel. Lauren Riley, the Chief Sustainability Officer at United Airlines, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Uh, Kaylee, um, in some ways, the heat that we're sitting in here <laughs> is representative of the challenge that ultimately we face here. Uh, it does seem as if things are getting warmer and warmer here at Farnborough. Back to you. All right, Guy. Well, again, stay hydrated. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Guy Johnson, and we'll look forward to his coverage from Farnborough throughout the day. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. The IMF said it will cut its global economic growth outlook substantially in its next update. That came after the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors ended their meeting in Bali without agreeing on a communique. The IMF already downgraded its outlook to 3.6% this year after Russia invaded Ukraine. And the UK is bracing for a heat wave this week. Temperatures in London and the south of England might hit a record 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than the forecast in Madrid, Rome, or Marseille. All of the UK's 10 warmest years have occurred since 2002. Coming up, we'll turn to the economy and the markets. Josie Dent, Center for Economics, Business Research Managing Economist, joins us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Wall Street report card, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America report second quarter earnings. We'll see how much market turmoil damaged or boosted the bottom line. Optimistic about oil, a U.S. energy envoy is confident that Gulf producers will increase output after President Biden's trip to the region. Saudi officials say that any decision to pump more will be made within the OPEC plus grouping. 
and the dollar dips. It extends the retreat from its record high. Analysts wonder if we're on track for a so-called dollar doom loop. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, uh, European equity markets really boosted, it seems, by at least at the margin, dialed back expectations for how the how aggressive the Fed is going to be on rates. Yeah, absolutely. Not a, not, not a lot of doom to start off the week on this Monday morning. And we had a pretty great rally on Friday, right? We were up almost 2% on the S&P 500. Right now we're looking at gains on S&P futures of a little bit more than 1% as investors sell 10-year debt. That yield floating back up towards 3% at 295.59. NYMEX crude is rising a little bit. So um, you've got to take uh, those statements from the U.S. Energy Envoy and Saudi Arabia maybe with a grain of salt in, in terms of how much they're going to boost uh, or what the prospects are for boosting production right now, 99 44 is what a barrel of Texas Intermediate costs, and Bitcoin is rising fairly substantially. Um, not like it used to move with 10 or 20 percent um, jumps in one day or drops in one day, but still 7 percent up to 22,362. That's a bigger move than we've seen of late, and we're getting away from that big round number. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre market movers? Well, a lot of them are tied to that very same rally in cryptocurrencies, Matt. The likes of Riot Blockchain and Marathon Digital, some of the outperforming performers in early hours, each up more than 8% uh, thanks to that rally in Bitcoin. And it's not just in crypto. You're seeing other tech players rallying as well. It seems that those high growth stocks are taking a nice uh, breather as sentiment gives a lift here. The likes of Tesla up about two percentage points and even Apple about one percent. And of course, those are two big heavyweight stocks, Anna, so they are going to have a hand in lifting the entire equity market uh, higher if these gains hold come the opening bell in about four hours. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of what is lifting the European stocks this morning, all sectors in positive territory through the early part of our trading day here in Europe. Uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the gainers, we've got energy and basic resources, the best performing sectors, the sort of more bond proxies, uh, less, uh, less uh, risk, uh, risk on sectors like telecoms, utilities and healthcare, bringing up the rear. But all of them in positive territory. The stock 600 then up by 1.3% near session highs at this stage of our trading day. The Brent crude price also rallying with risk assets up by more than 2%. So despite all the best efforts by the Biden administration in Saudi Arabia trying to persuade uh, them to pump more oil, it seems that we'll have to wait and see what OPEC Plus decides on that front and that risk on mood generating increased demand for oil at this point. The euro is in focus today and indeed this week. Euro dollar really in focus as we hear from the ECB this week. They are going to start, of course, their hiking cycle. All of the talk about how much hiking we get, Matt, from uh, the, the the Fed, no doubt could, could have made some forget that we haven't even seen a hike yet from the ECB, but they are due to start this week. How much will they be held back by peripheral government concerns around Italy and peripheral debt and also recession fears, of course? Yeah, we're going to start talking about that right now. The ECB meeting Thursday as it battles to restore store credibility with financial markets and our latest market live survey over 80 percent believe a recession will likely occur in Europe within the next six months. Joining us now is Josie Dent, manage, managing economist at the Center for Economic and Business Research. Josie, are we are we talking ourselves into a recession or um, is Europe really looking at a downturn right now economically? There are a lot of risks that make a recession much more likely. Um, of course, we've already seen the war in Ukraine have its impacts in terms of slower growth. Um, but then the more recent developments with Russia threatening to cut off gas, uh, making a gas crisis in the winter even more likely, um, will have a big impact. In particular, on production in Germany, um, the government's much more likely um, to limit gas supply um, to businesses than households. Uh, so that could create a significant reduction in industrial output over winter if we do see much more of a gas crisis, which will certainly be a contributing factor towards a recession. Um, then, of course, if we do see um, more hikes from the ECB, that will create um, make debt more expensive to repay, uh, which could also mm. have, um, have downwards impacts on economic output. Um, so there are lots of risks that make a recession more likely in the euro. Okay. We talk a lot, Josie, good morning to you. We talk a lot about the things that are making life more difficult for the ECB at this point, but we haven't really mentioned all that much the extent to which inflation really varies across the Eurozone. And I wonder if that is emerging as any kind of fault line at this point, whether there is any urge to, to or, or is it the case that fiscal policy can just sort of fix the gaps here? But I mean, we have inflation in Estonia, for example, that's the highest, running at 22%. 
Yeah, so for a lot of the, the countries right to the east um, of, of Europe, um, they're being much more heavily impacted um, by the crisis in Ukraine, by the much more expensive energy. And that's driving their inflation to be much higher than, for instance, France, um, where consumers have been a lot more protected um, by policies there against higher energy prices. Um, so it's really difficult for the ECB to make a one-fits-all one policy um, in terms of interest rates. Um, so for some countries are struggling with this high inflation a lot more, and they're the ones that are much more likely to drive us into a recession um, than the countries mm. that have much more moderate inflation at the moment. That's interesting. So an interesting test then of that one-size-fits-all monetary policy across uh, the vast Eurozone, Josie. In, in terms of the inflation dynamics in Europe and how they compare to the United States, uh, I've read quite a bit of analysis, that uh, assumptions being made by economists or analysis made by economists that US inflation is more demand-driven and perhaps more broad-based and in Europe it is more driven by energy markets. Is that a correct characterization? And does that lead to implications for how much monetary policy can really make a difference? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that idea. Um, in the US, there is a very tight labor market, which we are seeing across most of the world, but there is more evidence that there is more labor market tightness um, creating higher demand-driven inflation in the US than in Europe, where there is a slightly looser labor market. And of course, they have the direct impacts of the war on their doorstep, um, creating much more immediate impacts on energy and inflation which is by far the greatest driver of inflation at the moment, which of course does make it very tricky um, to, do, to do much at all um, to mitigate the impacts. Um, it's perhaps more of a fiscal policy issue than a monetary policy issue, which of course governments can mm. tailor more towards their country in order to protect consumers and businesses from the very high um, energy price increases that they're seeing. But of course that's incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive for many countries to achieve. Okay, Josie, well, let's focus on the U.S. a bit more because, as you say, more demand-driven. The Fed, in theory, can have a role in bringing that demand down and reading in inflation. The question is how aggressive the Fed is going to be in order to do that. It seems we've gotten away from the full percentage point narrative for this month, the market back toward expecting 75 basis points. But we know it's not just about the month of July and the size of the hike. It's about how many supersized hikes we see the Federal Reserve deliver and ultimately what the terminal rate is. Have you changed your assessment of what that terminal rate is likely to be given the 9.1% reading we got on CPI? Exactly. The latest inflation reading coming up e even higher um, increases um, the chances of further very high um, hikes in interest rates. And also even the retail sales data, which came out last week of a 1% increase, um, shows that um, there is a lot of demand in the U.S. economy and this very high rate of inflation is not yet causing consumers to tighten their purse strings a lot and stop spending, which might cause a recession. Um, it shows that the Fed does have a lot of room for movement on interest rate rises. And yes, while the market is pricing in around a 75 basis point increase um, at the end of this month, um, I, I still think it's a possibility that we could see a 100 basis point rise. We saw the Bank of Canada make a very tough move against inflation um, last week. Um, and then further interest rate rises towards the end of the year, I reckon will continue to be high around the 50 to 75, possibly even one percentage point rise, uh, just because the US is really having to battle this inflation. And also we're seeing signs that Powell is willing to battle this inflation a lot. Yeah, he's made that very clear that their focus is on inflation, less so on the labor market, and that ultimately if what they have to risk is growth in order to get inflation down, they will do that. But Josie, as you say, describing this aggressive Federal Reserve and also a strong consumer is essentially your thesis here that the Fed can be that aggressive and we won't necessarily see a recession. Yeah, that's true. While a recession is still possible, uh, we are forecasting overall growth this year of 2.4% in the U.S., which is weak, but it's positive. Um, and so it's likely that, that the Fed is not too worried um, about, about growth and really wants to get this inflation under control, because if it doesn't, then that itself could have growth impacts if we see high inflation for way too long. Josie, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Josie Dent of the Centre for Economics and Business Research. Coming up on the programme, funding for crypto startups hitting a one-year low. We will speak with Ophelia Brown, founder and partner at crypto venture capital firm Blossom Capital. She th knows a thing or two about funding startups in this field. More next. This is Greenberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Airbus CEO Guillaume Fauri. That's at 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. A lot of the discourse around, you know, COVID and pandemics in general has, you know, as, as you sort of, you know, reference, focused on things like masks. By the time that's the debate, we have already failed um, at the much more important goal, which is avoiding ending up there in the first place by having countermeasures ready beforehand, by having early detection systems, by having good ventilation in buildings. The goal is to get to a place where outbreaks don't become pandemics in the first place and where we don't have to shut down uh, you know, the economy, where people don't have to die, where we don't have to make trade-offs. And hopefully we can, you know, I think, spend you know, tens of billions of dollars today to save tens of trillions of dollars. Bloomberg Shanali Basak speaking with crypto billionaire Sam Bankman Fried on the next big risk. And Shanali special is available now on the Bloomberg Terminal and Bloomberg.com. Plus, you can tune in Wednesday for a full airing at 9.30 p.m. New York time. Well, venture capitalists are facing a reckoning as economic uncertainty and lackluster returns have prompted investors to hold back following the startup funding boom in 2021. And that is especially true in crypto. According to PitchBook, in the second quarter, only $6.76 billion in venture money was invested into crypto companies, a 31% decline from the first quarter. Joining us now is Ophelia Brown, founder and partner at venture capital firm Blossom Capital. Ophelia, great to speak with you. So clearly, we have seen a cooling in funding in the crypto space. How much money are you willing to put to work right now in the middle of a crypto winter? Thanks for having me on this morning. I think it's important to highlight, yes, uh, crypto funding is down uh, year on year and quarter on quarter. But as you mentioned, uh, it's in the backdrop of overall VC funding being down year on year. I think that's uh, in line with what we're seeing in the public markets and um, investors are rightly cautious, especially at the late stage um, funding. Um, from Blossom's perspective, we're an early stage investor. Um, we're looking to invest in teams um, and companies that are just bringing products to market. I think that's why we're particularly excited about the potential applications for Web3 and decentralized technologies. And so while funding is down year on year, we, we still um, wholly believe in the long-term potential for digital assets. And we actually see the pullback in valuations as an attractive entry point. Okay, so if entry points are attractive, what specifically, what type of company are you looking to invest in right now? Absolutely. So we have the um, potential to hold both digital assets, coins, tokens, as well as make equity investments into infrastructure that will enable digital assets. Um, we are particularly excited on the infrastructure side. I think that uh, in order for the applications to be able to scale to the use cases that we believe in across consumer, across uh, the future of work, even uh, finance, uh, we believe that the infrastructure needs to improve significantly. And so that's where most of our attention is uh, being made right now. In terms of the kind of sort of rug pull schemes that we've seen and uh, the kind of regulation that's necessary, how much further do you think we have to go? I think we have a long way to go. And I think recent events have really woken up the regulations um, to the need to move with speed in the sector um, and to come out uh, with regulation that's going to especially protect retail investors. Um, I think unfortunately, and you know, we have we seen in the uh, 2008 crash, there are always going to be bad actors in any financial ecosystem. And it's events that have happened and especially caused retail investors to lose funds recently. But hopefully we're going to see some positive outcomes out of recent events. Are you optimistic about the, the merge? You know, we're showing Ether's price right now, the shift from proof of work to proof of stake. Yes, we are very excited. Um, we're excited about uh, the number of people that will be willing to build continue, or to continue building applications on top of Ethereum once the merge has taken place. I think there has been quite a bit of uncertainty in, um, in advance of the knowing when the date was going to happen and how exactly the merge would take place. But as we get more clarity and we come uh, to that moment happening, I think that we'll see a lot more activity, um, especially towards the end of this year and 
beginning of next mm. year. How much more sustainable does that make uh, crypto products then, Ophelia, when we move from one to the other? And does that open up crypto assets to pools of funding that maybe would have ruled it out on e environmental grounds previously? I think that it uh, will open up. I think it's more kind of the uncertainty in the... Um, People are looking for more stability um, in these protocols, and that's not just Ethereum. I think, you know, security is a is a big issue, especially for institutions looking to invest or build on top of these uh, layer one protocols. And so I think that the better the infrastructure becomes, the better security, the more that we can rely on these. We're expecting to see a lot more funding come into the space over the next few years. And one of the things we're watching very closely in London, uh, of course, Ophelia, where you and I both find ourselves, is regulation. And I know that some uh, crypto, you know, people who are paid by the crypto industry and enthusiastic about its future, calling for, for London to work faster on its regulatory backdrop, seeing what, what Europe is doing. Do you think that London is keeping up with what the EU is doing? I think the FCA are working hard uh, to bring as much regulation as possible to the sector and certainly, you know, with uh, license activity, they've been reviewing a number of startups at quick pace. I think it is important, especially given how risky this asset class is for retail investors, um, that regulation moves in line with the speed of which founders and teams are building. What do you expect in terms of the future of CBDCs or indeed something like Tether. I mean, are we going to be are we going to be all using some form of digital currency in say ten years, Ophelia? I think if you look to uh, especially the younger generations, you know, millennials, Gen Zs, it's um, a large proportion of them, you know, majority overwhelmingly know of digital assets, hold digital assets, are active. Um, I think that is going to increase um, over time, especially as these topics that I've just mentioned, like stability. Um, they become less risky and um, they're more clear in terms of the utility. We'll see a lot more activity um, by general consumers in the space. Um, I think in terms of whether or not people are holding stable of coins, um, you know, I think that uh, will come with regulation. Obviously, what happened uh, with Luna um, was a big wake up call for the regulators. And I think that um, stable coins in particular need addressing. All right, Ophelia, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. Ophelia Brown there, Blossom Capital founder and partner, talking to us about crypto. By the way, tune in to our program, Bloomberg Crypto. That's every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. This week, we're live from the Bloomberg Crypto Summit, which will gather some of the biggest names in the industry. Kaylee and I will both be there. The summit starts in person and virtually around 8.45 a.m. New York time and continues all day long on July 19th. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards over in London. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us now ahead of his program. Tom, what's your single best chart today? Could be any number of ones with quieter markets here. We got green on the screen in equities, and I'm going to call it a churn with Brent 103. So why don't we stay in the banks, Matt? This is a chart I run out three, four times a year from the great financial crisis from August normalized J.P. Morgan down to Wells Fargo, down to below 2007 levels, the Bank of America, even with the great four-year Moynihan recovery, and Citigroup coming up, uh, as my mother would say, tail of cow. These are four major banks with massive differences in relative performance. Massive differences in relative performance, and you've given us a nice long-term chart, takes us through the highs and lows of the global economy, something that Ken Rogoff has been tracking, of course, and I know he joins you today. Yeah, I really want to talk to him about crypto. Ken has written the definitive book on negative interest rates and also cash worldwide, the criminality of it, his great The Curse of Cash. Last time we talked, he was scathing about the slow-motion effort of governments and crypto. That's one of the things we'll touch on. 
Okay, really interesting. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, the uh, the need for regulation with our last guest, Tom Keane. Thank you so much. Uh, Tom Keane will be back with the rest of the team, of course, at the top of the hour. Now, Matt, on to what we are watching, and I am certainly watching and feeling the heat wave that we have through much of Europe. It's causing wildfires in much of Europe, has been doing for days, and now spreading up to the UK as well. I just checked, and the temperature in the city of London right now, and it's not even 11 a.m. here, just coming up to that, 31 degrees C, that's 88 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit at just before 11 o'clock. Will we get as high as 40 degrees centigrade or 104 Fahrenheit? These are the types of numbers we're talking about here. And of course, more seriously, excess heat can lead to excess deaths. And that's something we've been warned about a lot over the weekend, not just for those in the much older age groups, but also more recently, we've seen excess deaths coming through in slightly younger age groups. So uh, that's what where a lot of people's thoughts are right now. We've seen warnings for people mm. not to travel unless they really have to, because significant travel disruption is expected, particularly here in the UK where we're just not used to temperatures getting as high as this. Right. I mean, I'm coming from Berlin where temperatures get that high seemingly every August. Um, my thoughts are a on price, you know, here in the US um, and certainly obviously there in Europe, uh, the price has gone much higher to air condition your home, although we tend to use AC more than you do. In Texas, this is a there's a much bigger concern than price, and that is that the grid may absolutely collapse. You know, Texas has long operated its grid independently from the rest of the country. It's resisted building more connections with other states to balance electricity supplies, and it's had grid problems already um, over the past week. Now it looks like the temperature is going to remain above 100 in a number of cities in Texas, including uh, Dallas, Houston, and Lubbock. So it'll be a concern there to see if people run their ACs, and that just ruins the grid. Mm, yeah, and I know there have been calls on people to use energy only at certain times of the day. Matt, we'll keep watching uh, climate and, uh, and temperatures in many parts of the world. This is Bloomberg.